I love that, uh, the passage you read. Uh, that happens early on in the book. And I think it's, um, it's, it's indicative of, of, the, of the sadness, I think of the introspection, the humor, sometimes understated, sometimes more pronounced, that's, uh, that's throughout the book. Uh, but before we go into more about the guts of the book, so to speak, I want to ask you something very simple first. Who is Aaron England, and, and what's his story? <laughs> yeah, and you said that's something very simple. Yes. Um, well, I'm going to answer that, assuming that most of you haven't read the book. And so, Aaron England is basically a 41-year-old man who has been with Walter, his much older partner, for over 20 years. And he, we learned fairly early on, he grew up in a small town in Minnesota. I grew up in a town of 400 people in Minnesota. 411, but <laughs> we'll say 400. And so Aaron also grew up in a town of 400 people. And this is a world I know very well. And when I started to kind of think about how that world shapes people, and I started to think about why people leave, I was someone who left. Most people I knew didn't leave. Um, I started to think about Aaron and a kid like this. Aaron is, is what probably would have been called a, a sissy the time, during the time that I grew up. In the, I was born in 1965, Aaron and I. Uh, conveniently share a birthday. <laughs> and that made my life so much easier when I was writing this 40 year you know, period of time. Um, but the book is basically looking at him from the time that he's five years old and his father dies. And we learn very early on his father fell off of a parade float and onto his head and died. And follows him right up until this period of six months when he's moved to San Francisco and has left the partner of over 20 years to finally, for the first time in his life, be alone. He's never been alone. This is a, it, at one point in the book, um, one of the characters talks about how you don't read very many sad tales anymore. And to me, really, this, this was a sad story. There's to say, it's definitely. So I wanted to ask you, though, what is it you think, though, about sad tales that are healing? For readers? For readers. Or for writers? For both. <laughs> because I, I would actually argue that sad tales are more appealing for writers in some way than for readers. I Well, I think that a lot of times, and I'm basing this on teaching, maybe, but a lot of times my students, um, it's one of the first things they say after they've read many sad tales uh, during the semester is, why, why, is there, why are there no happy tales? And so I think they would be very happy to read happy tales. Um, I don't know. Do you think that that's true? Because I'm kind of curious now that you're asking it. Well, it seems that you know it touches places. You know, when it, as a reader um, going through your book, um, I felt that there was something uh, actually invigorating about the sadness. Okay. I I also like the sadness. I tend to think that happiness is something that's very fleeting. It happens in a moment. It's not necessarily. I don't mean that everyone is running around depressed. I just think that happiness happens in these small moments. You feel, you know, my cat jumps up on the bed for no reason and seems happy to see me. And that, you know, it's these very small things. But I don't think it's kind of the general state. I don't think people walk around in a state of happiness, certainly not euphoria. And so when I wrote the book, it was interesting. Somebody asked me, how did you deal with being in this unhappy world for so long. And to me, it didn't seem unhappy. I liked Aaron. Um, I liked the world he lived in. He is lonely, but I wasn't bothered by his unhappiness. No, it seems, I mean, I think that's what I meant by invigorating, that he, is, <laughs> he seems to be, he's very much aware of, of his life. He's introspective. Mm -hmm. And it's like this, this, is it this, it's this sadness, really, in many ways, that compels him to figure out, you know, you know, why did I leave Walter? 
after 20 years. And also, you know, trying to get to perhaps some sort of root. You know, where is this all coming from? Where is it all coming from? And I think that's something you're only really allowed to do when you do spend time alone. I mean, he's a person who's never, ever been alone. And I think we all know um, that when you have those moments where there's nobody else in your house and you're not talking to other people, it's very easy to slip into an introspective state and a state that feels maybe almost melancholy, but for me certainly not in a, in a bad way. I enjoy it. I mean, I'm always happy when my partner is home and I'm always happy when my partner goes away also. You know, there's something very nice about it. She's smiling at me nicely about that. But there's something very nice about just closing the door. She's always worried that I'm going to get feel too alone and she's always telling people call her and make her go out for a drink. And, you know, make sure she leaves the house. But I think there's something nice about that introspection, and I think that's what you're talking about. I, I think it's so really too. In that state. And um, and I would it be so while I was reading it too, I kept thinking there's something also about this sadness that seems familiar. And and then it, it happened to me when I when uh, uh, Willa Cather kept popping up um, uh, throughout the book, and I want to ask you about that too. at some point. Uh, uh, Aaron is a is a big reader. He, he reads a lot. Uh, he you know he likes uh, 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 Richard Hugo, uh, yes. his poetry, and uh, Catherine. And um, I thought, aha, my Antonia. Um, and I thought, is there is this is this a Midwestern sensibility? I'm 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 coming across here. That is to say, uh, it's not pretentious. It doesn't flatter the reader. It it's it's it looks at things coolly, and I think. Even in some cases, even generously, and uh, in, in by doing so, it seems to reveal a lot of the richness in life without, I guess, strutting about it. If that, if, if I could say that. You know, it's it's funny. So I'm 50. I um, left Minnesota when I was 23, but I grew up in a hardware store. So the first 18 years of my life, and my parents were also Protestant. So we never took vacations. We just were in the hardware store working six days a week, and then the seventh day was the Sabbath. And so I think that I very much grew up with this kind of hardworking, um, maybe don't step out into the world. And it wasn't until my first book came out. I've been gone from there for many, many years. I've lived most of my life away from Minnesota. But I think it wasn't really until my first book came out and people started to identify the book as a Midwestern book. She's a Minnesota writer. Catherine, who was one of my students many years ago, came to my office hours and I remember she said, I read your book over the Christmas break and I feel like I just got you know, a crash course in what it means to be Minnesotan. <laughs> and I had no idea. I mean, that seems almost silly to say because I realize I'm very shaped by being from Minnesota, but it hadn't occurred to me how much that was the case. And I, I think probably that is very much a part of it. Not talking about things too much. Growing up in my parents' hardware store, I was very shy. Um, and just listening. But mainly when people talk, at least where I grew up, it's you have to be very good at kind of interpreting what people don't say, because that's where the real message is happening. It's never about what people are saying. It's always subtext. And a couple of years ago, when my partner is from New York, and I moved to the South, to North Carolina, and she had a terrible time there. And I fell right at home, because I was so used to that kind of, like everything happens with subtext. And that felt very natural to me to just interpret that. And so I think there's a lot of that in the book. I think that um, people are never quite saying what they're thinking about. They're often telling stories. There's a lot of digression. And I think we talk in the Midwest with a lot of digression. Everything kind of meanders around. There's a lot of silence. And the book is on the structure that way in the sense that there's anecdotes that accrete and we start getting a sense of, of this, of this, of not only just Aaron's life, the life of his mother, his father, of his, of, of, and as much as we can through these sort of snippets of his, of his Walter, et cetera, right. and certain people. Um, did you, well, the, the two things, um, 
and maybe it's because of my own sort of um, hang up with this, but grammar prop pops up a lot <laughs> in this book, as in proper use of. And I was almost horrified by how kindergartners had to, uh, well, you know, learn uh, how to properly wield the language. And I wanted to ask you, did you grow up with, 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 are you, first of all, are you a stickler for grammar, or did you grow up with people who are sticklers for grammar? Everyone's laughing because the people who know me know that I'm a terrible stickler for grammar. But I think, so where I grew up, um, there was a lot of attention paid to grammar. The schools were very much about the basics. And so we learned how to read really well, we learned how to diagram sentences really well, and we learned math. But I don't remember, throughout my high school years, I don't think we read books. I mean, our study of literature, I did all my reading on my own. And I think at a certain point, um, I took that and it seemed like something very safe for me. You know, I went out into the world and grammar and the ability to articulate certain ideas became very important to me. Um, Does it give you a sense of, in the book, the way, the way I, I, I interpret it is that you know, having this command of a grammar, in some sense, gives you, maybe the illusion, maybe it actually does give you, control over your life. That's to say, here's something that you can bring clarity out of. Here's something where you can you know, make sure meaning is conveyed the way exactly the way you want it to. Uh, you know, and of course that's always the illusion. I think for many years I taught ESL. And one thing that teaching ESL taught me, I'm used to communicating with a lot of subtlety and nuance because that was how I grew up. With ESL teaching, you have to find the most direct way to say you have to forget any ideas of nuance and, you know, a nuanced sort of idea. You're just going strictly for communication. And there's something very liberating about that. I remember when I finally um, realized that with my students. You know, my students would come in and, um, you know, they would say to me, can you tell me how to tell the pharmacist that I have diarrhea? And so for me that was mortifying, but I was like, okay, but I can teach you how to do that. And we would cover the entire board and it would be like, you know, here's every word you need to know. Constipation, diarrhea, you know, do not say this. This word is appropriate to tell your landlord that there were feces on the front steps, but do not say that to your doctor, you know, and stop saying poo-poo to your doctor. So those things were very liberating for me. But with my students, as close as, especially when I was teaching ESL, as close as I felt to them, I also tend to pull back. I like a, a certain boundary. And so there always was a point where if it felt like it was veering off into more than maybe I wanted to talk about, I could just say, say that sentence again, but use the past tense correct. <laughs> and so there's something very nice, I think, about having grammar as a buffer, um, or I think at least that's what Aaron does with his students. There's a certain default that whenever things get too close for him, he's having to think too much, he goes to grammar. And so I suppose that's something I've done in my life. <laughs> so. uh, this idea of clarity and communication is a big theme in the book. And at one point, Aaron says, Clarity is important, but maybe clarity is sometimes about knowing what you don't need to know. Could you explain? What, what, what does he mean by that? Yeah, well that comes at the, at the end of the book. Um, when he's gone to find out what happened to this child, Jacob, that I read to you about. And I think at a certain point he realizes that sometimes you can dig and dig and dig I'm going to sound like a med westerner here also. But you can dig and dig and dig so much that all you're doing is kind of digging and trying to find, you think you're going to find the answers to things. And I think he realizes that at a certain point. That sometimes it's just okay to move ahead and the clarity is seeing I don't need to kind of dig backwards anymore. I've reached the point where now I can just go forward. There seems to be that, I, I, for me, the, it's, it's kind of all tied into this in some ways, like the idea of things like closure, 
where things will resolve themselves. The thing is that people need to believe that, that they, you know, that they have to have the full narrative. Okay, but often, you know, that's, you rarely ever get that. And I think that's always the trick when you're trying. I struggle with endings. I struggle with endings in with short stories. I struggle with endings with this novel. Um, the summer of 2013 when I was trying to pull this whole book together and so I went into what we call the dungeon and it's just a room in our basement that doesn't have windows and it's a great place to write because there's no outside distraction and so I basically for about 70 hours a week was down in the dungeon piecing this together and I was seeing the story coming together and what I wanted it to be about but the only thing I didn't know was the ending. There were so many things I didn't know. Um, does he find out what happened to his mother? Does he find out what happened to Jacob? Is he going to be happy? And I think readers maybe want to know those things a little bit, but I don't think that, I don't think we ever have a day or a moment where suddenly everything from our past suddenly resolves itself. And so I, to do that on the page I think would be difficult also. Um, I um. When I was uh, when I first started the book, I think about the first thirty pages, I was a little disoriented because I was trying to f figure out exactly the set or the, the time in which the forty-one-year-old Aaron was living, and and, and then, then I figured it out. But then I realized the reason I was so confused is because he didn't. There was. There, the ubiquity of iPhone and internet. Phone. There was none of that. Yeah, and the minute that was removed, I couldn't tell. Yeah. It's like, what, is, what, what era is this? <laughs> you know, it was funny because my copy editor, so it never occurred to me. I don't, I have a flip phone, but as anyone who's ever tried to call me can tell you, I never answered that phone. And <laughs> Kathleen, my hairdresser, is here. In order for me to get an appointment with her and my partner, texts her, she texts back. I do not use the telephone. And so I opened up my texts today, and I had texts from people saying, I'm on chapter three, and I'm thinking, who is this? <laughs> Say your name. I have no idea who's writing to me from area code 303. And so but I had texts going back months. So it never occurred to me ever that Aaron had a, a cell phone. And then the copy editor kept writing things like, but wouldn't he just call on his cell phone? I'm like, no, because he doesn't have a cell phone. And I thought, do I have to explain that? Do I have to say in the beginning, this is a man in a U-Haul who has no cell phone? But I think it's really disorienting for people because he's not sitting there, he's not looking at his iPhone, he's not at the computer, he just lives in a basement garage without his phone. And it was well initially disorienting, but then later, but oh, this is this is so nice. Um, you, know, you you forget it was almost like a time capsule. Oh, that, that's what that used to be like, and and it made sense that you know yeah I guess I suppose you could be much more introspective if you're not constantly being distracted. I think that's really true, Oscar. You're not being constantly pulled into the outside world. I don't like the cell phone. First of all, I don't, I have a phone phobia. Um, but I also don't like when I'm standing at a corner waiting to cross the street and then the person next to me is on their phone and they're talking about their sex life or they're crying about something that happened. I feel for me that is so intimate and I'm just thinking I don't know you and I want to cross the street. But right now we're right next to each other and I feel awful that your life is falling apart. But do I say something? That for me, that's for the, you know, I don't know. So I just never think you should talk on the phone. <laughs> and so I never take my phone in public. It, I, well, I think, it, it, I think in this case, it, it, I think it works beautifully for, for the novel. It actually makes, it, it, it all makes sense. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the funny thing too, because at first I was a little disoriented, it reminded me, like, oh, San Francisco in 95 or 96, I remember that. Yeah, you know, before, you know, everyone had iPhones and this sort of thing. And yeah, I guess if you did want to meet someone, you, you, if you missed them, you'd go back to where you first saw them and hope they come around. Or, you know, you, you, you get a lot of reading done. You know, you walk. Uh, you and it, and to, to 
sort of, I guess, further enforced that 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 that, that feeling with me was how well you depicted San Francisco. That is to say, the San Francisco in after the parade is not the San Francisco of today's neighborhoods or the tech world. It is the San Francisco of muni drivers, ESL teachers, and people who ride the 38 Geary, or and people who live in perhaps not quite legal studios in garages <laughs> and Parkside. And I wanted to ask you while you were writing that, were you sort of, did you have any sort of uh, sense that maybe in some ways you were capturing a time that may be slipping away? You know, it's interesting. We moved here in 2005 from Albuquerque, and when we arrived here, I we were living on 28th over in the park side, outer sunset, and we were living in a, in a in a house, and the neighbors on one side of us they were it was attached. We just fought all the time. So when I was writing the beginning of this story, I was just thinking about that, about how it feels to live next to somebody where you can hear every argument that they're having. And I mean, fortunately, a lot of the times they were having the arguments in Chinese. And so I was overhearing it, but I didn't understand it. And I just would think, I wonder what they're arguing about today. And there was something kind of nice about that, but I realized that that all seeped into the novel. And so there's Aaron living you know, in a studio apartment, and up above him, his landlord and landlady are arguing. And every time they switch to English, he just takes it very personally because he feels like suddenly they're inviting him into the argument. You know, why would you switch to English in the middle of the night unless you... And, but it was very much because that was the world I was living in. We were living, you know, there was a place where we used to always go on Terravel called T28. And I loved that they called their place T28. They had the best dumplings. It was a, a Chinese Macau place. And T28. And it was just a handy mnemonic you know, you, we want you to remember where we are. We're at Terrible in 28, and that's the name. And so that was the world I was living in. We, that was where we walked around. That was where we had lunch every weekend. And so I don't even think I was thinking about that. I was walking to work. I worked over in the Richmond, and I would walk through that neighborhood and into the park. You know, it was like an hour and a half, and stop and watch the bison. Sometimes I'd take the bus. And so it was really more about the intersection of getting up every morning, writing, listening to my neighbors argue, then walking through the sunset, you know, through the park, and then coming home with all of that kind of in my head and writing about it. It was the world I knew when I moved here. I mean, it's still kind of... It's a very appealing world, I can tell you. I, for, I used to live out on 5th uh, in California, oh. in the Richmond. Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, I remember... Uh, uh, the, the particular neighborhood, but also just how, and maybe it has, it's a function of the fog, um, seemingly cutting it off from the rest of the city. But that, that scene, the work a day of San Francisco, San Francisco has to say, that's incredibly uh, multicultural. I mean, just from dozens of nations, and people of all different kinds of languages, you know, uh, spoken. But also one in which, um, I, you know, you see people seem to be working in jobs not, not involving startups. Um, which would be the vast majority. Um, so I just, because uh, I've been talking for a little bit, obviously. So I, I'll open it up to questions now if anyone wants to ask uh, anything from Lori. If not, I have more questions, so it'll be fine. We won't come to the screeching halt, but um, we'll break down the fourth wall. Okay, so I, I want to get back to, uh, I initially brought up the uh, Willa Cather. And, um, at least, I think at least twice in the book, death comes from the archbishop. Uh, uh, is, is, it comes up. I, and s I skipped, actually, there was a mention, and I skipped it tonight <laughs> because I was trying to shorten what I was reading. And basically, the characters who, who talk about it say they, they don't like it. One of them, I think, didn't finish it, and the other didn't like it. I love that book. I yeah. love that novel. So I want to know what's wrong with it, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love Willa Cather, and I've read every single one of her books. And I think in New Mexico, because it's loved Death, yeah. in New Mexico. And so people were always making me feel guilty about not liking that book. And I'm very susceptible to feeling guilty <laughs> about not liking certain books. And 
there was always this feeling, I remember somebody telling me that they were told by a, a dissertation advisor that they needed to work harder to like that book. And I've always felt that I had to work harder to like that book. And so I just decided to, you know, make that a part of it. <laughs> you're, you're basically finding all of the ways in which my life yes. crossed with air. <laughs> so I just never, I love every other one of her books, but I'm... I, that's all right. I'm, so I just thought maybe there was something one. specific about that, about that one book that maybe you know, drove you up the wall or something. No, like I think it was more the constant expectation that if you ever say, well, look, Catherine, New Mexico, right. you must love one. death when it comes for the Archbishop. And then I'm always in the position of saying every one of our books for that one. Absolutely. <laughs> I, and I'll just throw this on the side. I think um, uh, Death Comes for the Archbishop, I think, was published two years after Great Gatsby. Um, and, uh, but, but for my money, I, I boil to Catherine. Uh, over Fitzgerald, it's probably not a uh, two potential donors. This is a, a a a wise thing to say, but my lord, uh, 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 yes, I would. I would take half over Fitzgerald. Um, uh, you also do something that, that I found um, incredibly, I think, uh, admirable. Not only just from the, the the craft point of view, but also in terms of empathy in the way you portray. Uh, broadly speaking, Christians in books, specifically Protestant evangelicals, like I, I, I could call them that. Um, you, it, you know, so in the book, Aaron is, is, is he atheist or agnostic, would you say? He's, he's definitely not religious. He's not religious. Right. Yeah. And um, the way he, he observes uh, his uncle at one point who, who takes him into their family, and then a friend of his, in her experiences, with the roommate, mm -hmm. who, who was also evangelical, um, you, you, con you convey, I think, um, what from an outsider, someone like me might say, what seems to me almost disturbing in, in, in behavior and somewhat maybe crazy, but you convey a, a, an empathy, I mean there's empathy there, and there's almost a tenderness. And you sort of, I guess, answered this earlier, but I want to get back to it. I, mean, I, I assume while reading it, maybe perhaps then you've been raised, in that sort of uh, 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 creed, or maybe new people like that? I did. I was raised um, very much in that, in that way. And, you know, it's been a, a, a kind of a, something that has, has caused me to be estranged from my family for many years, off and on. And so I think the tendency is always when we sit down to write, or at least for me, I always sit down to write about the things that I may be angry about, or, you know, in my first, in my collection, I was so angry at my father, we'd always had a difficult relationship, and so I sat down to write this story just thinking, like, I will get him now, I'm just going to write such a story. You know, the reality is you can't do that, and I always tell my students that, they'll come in and they'll say, I had a, you know, a, teacher when I was learning to ride horses and she was awful and I'm going to write a story about like the worst horse teacher in the world, <laughs> you know. And so we'll have this whole discussion, but the reality is that writing that's about revenge is never very satisfying and what ends up happening always is that you kind of go over to that other side and you're always trying to figure out how do I see this from the perspective of the other person, which is the hardest thing to do and certainly the hardest thing for me to do ever in my life. I'm not very good at it, but I'm good at it, or try to be good at it, in my writing. And so that was one of the things that I wanted to think about. And it would have been very easy to um, poke fun or to kind of go for the lowest common denominator. Um, but as I started to write it, I realized that here he is, this kid, and these people, these born-agains, take him in. He doesn't even know he has an uncle. His, his father is estranged from his brother, and his mother has a breakdown, and suddenly he gets taken in by this aunt and uncle. And the uncle is, you know, he's, he's awful. He's terrible. But he forges this friendship with the, with the aunt. 
And as I wrote, I mean, that happened purely as I was writing it. I thought, I started out thinking, it's just going to be this awful uncle, and that's going to be great. I'm just going to make him so bad. And then instead, I thought, you know what? The aunt is really nice. She's obsessed with the rapture. She's, you know, she, but she talks to him like he's an adult, and she discusses things with him. And by the end of writing it, I realized that it had become a whole different thing. And I think, too, in those, in those particular um, uh, uh, sections I'm talking about, you, what I mean by empathy is you feel empathy for the children who grow up like this. You know, um, you know the, the ch certainly his, his cousins, you, you feel for that, and you also feel for the, for the young woman who is in the dormitory and is slowly but surely losing her mind. Yes. You know, was that, imagine, was that you that maybe received the point? <laughs> well, not you, not you, but I mean, in the sense of, you know, instead of channeling revenge, then finding, you know, uh, finding that commonality <coughs> with another character. <coughs> yeah, that character was an interesting, it's a woman who basically feels the devil was in her, and she's possessed. and. You know, I remember in college watching a woman down the hallway fall apart slowly but surely and chop off all of her hair and she thought the devil was in her and then the next day she was gone. And it, it always stayed with me. It was a story that I, you know, I think that she had all of these very real fears about being away from home and school and measuring up. And, but I think the way that it, it maybe manifested itself had to do with the things that she knew, which were religion, and and that was the way that it came out. So that was an entire vocabulary for understanding what was happening to her. Right. So that the only explanation so, could be some sort of evil or something. Yeah, and and I grew up in that environment. So it's I understand it. Well okay, I don't I know it. So. <laughs> Question. Yes, please. Uh, very hi. Hi, Um, Two questions. How did you write from a point of view and why? <laughs> two, how did you come about, come about the name? Uh, I think it's Asinic with yours. Aaron Ian's story often. So, how did that name reveal itself to you? Well, I'll start with his. So, the character's name is Aaron Anglin. Mine is Lori Oslin. Um, where I grew up, everyone has a name that ends in Lund. <laughs> it's just the way, you know, I grew up in a town where everybody is Northern European, most of them are Norwegian or Swedish, and their names either end with Kvist or Lund or Sun. And so that was not a stretch. I just <laughs> thought about everyone who lived around me as a kid, and I was like, okay, it's going to be England. Um, the first question, Simma, why did I decide to write from the point of view? I don't know that I decided. I mean, I anticipated that kind of being the question that, that I would get asked most often. And I don't think I ever decided. I think when I started to write this character, I started to write about a kid who'd been bullied, who had been a bit of a sissy. And that character was a boy. And it actually was, and for the first several years, I mean, I think I wrote 400 pages, and he was just in second grade. And that was obviously going nowhere. It was just every blow by blow of, of what his life was. But I think I was getting to know him. And at a certain point, I realized he was a boy, and it was great, because I think with writing, at least for me, I always have to start with something that is me. I have to find a way in. And so it's usually some trait or experience, or actually, as Oscar's pointed out, a whole bunch of traits or experiences. <laughs> and that becomes this way in, but early on I have to make some big decisions about how that can veer off in major ways. Otherwise, you're locked into just, you know, this one way, and you keep following that, and pretty soon you only have one option. It's the option of what happened instead of the option of what the story really is. So it was so wonderful that he was a man because it made my life so much easier. I understood very quickly what the differences were. And it was, it was funny because when Scribner's 
lawyer called to kind of vet the book as they do to just make sure that there were you no know, problems coming down the road, I guess. Um, she said, I'm not worried about you because I, I can tell right away you're not a gay man. And so, <laughs> so <laughs> and I'm not. So uh, I made that very She's easy. on top of her game. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I kind of liked having that very clear differentiation because he and I have so many similarities. Another question, please. Why a sissy? Why a sissy? Why did I want it to be a sissy? Yeah. Mm. I don't know that I wanted him to be a sissy, but I do know growing up in that world, and that's the world that shaped me. But I think that in the 1970s, if you were a sissy, the world is not very kind to sissies. And so when I was thinking about who this character was and his vulnerabilities and why he would leave this place, that seemed like the natural thing to make him. I mean, this, the book actually started much earlier than that. It's just a concept. The concepts are a disaster. But I was thinking about something that had happened in this town when I was a kid that I never fully understood. Um, this man was arrested for abusing three brothers. And when he got out of prison, he came back to this town of 400 people. And I couldn't wrap my head around that, because I just thought it's a huge world. And so to come back from prison and go straight back to this place where, of course, you're going to be a pariah, why would you do that? And so this whole idea of what makes people leave, and I had wanted to leave, and why did I want to leave, and what makes other people really need the familiar. And so when I started to think about Aaron, I just thought, you know what? He's a sissy. He wants out of here. What other reasons people do? And that seemed like one. Yes, please. You had a question? Uh, well, actually, I had a comment. Um, I'm thinking of the and I loved it. Uh, so I was thinking, uh, I thought it was, it was almost like you had a premonition of how uh, some certain things San Francisco was going to go because as I was reading the book, I didn't feel that it was said that San Francisco was the past. I felt like it was very much here and now. This, even though, as you know, a lack of cell phone notwithstanding, um, I, I really liked that he lived in that garage. I thought that was really neat that he had to live in that garage. Uh, there are a lot of people living in those garages now. What's happening in the city with rents? And landlords who can take their garages and chop them up into rentable spaces and lot of people. Um, and there are a lot of people right now scrambling to get those spaces get rid of that category of, of you know, that kind of place to live. They call them in law, or in law apartments. Um, there's everything to terrible, so Aaron kind of has the terrible. But I, I just thought that was like you had a premonition of how it was going. You know, I was, yeah, I was thinking about, I don't know if you remember our first place, Annette, that we lived on briefly. But when you're San Francisco on to teacher salaries, you live in some odd places. And I think what I liked even more than that was he was coming from a life that was a very kind of established life. He and his partner had been together forever. They had this nice house. They had all of their friends. They had a very set routine. He had his job. And there's something really disorienting about having all of that change, you know, about not coming home to a house where you sit down with your partner and you have dinner and you talk about your days and just that very kind of middle kind of existence was something that I wanted to capture and so it seemed to me to suddenly take him and put him in this tiny garage was something that I just wanted to do. So I wish that I could say that I was Christian, but I was not. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, but that's, but, but I, that was the word I was looking for. I but I, it's very moving when, he, when you see him do that, when you see him in that space like the first time, part when he goes in there and he's 
of all of the you know, problems that it's having at one point, plus the people that we can hear and can do. Uh, just one more little comment is you were saying how the book is sad, and it does have a lot of uh, sad things in it. But I also think it has an awful lot of humor in it. And if you know Laura, you, you know, just if you hear now, I've listened to her talk. It's all, all that is, is there. It's very entertaining. Thank There's, you, it's, it's both. You've been a good plant. <laughs> no, no, I agree. There's, as I said, beginning, but there's definitely in, a, in the book. Absolutely. I think it was hard to find a section to read, and I know that the section I write to you did not seem humorous. And, well, it wasn't humorous. Um, and with my story collection, I realized that when I did readings, I always chose pieces that were humorous, and short stories are more compressed, and so it was easy to do that. When I was looking today, I was just thinking it's, it's a much harder thing with a novel to pick pieces that will make sense. And so, and I was say, I think one one of the sections of the book where the sort of these two things dovetail the sort of sadness with the humor is when they meet Clary, or when Aaron meets uh, uh, Clary and Gloria for the first time. Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly funny. Um, Clary, the character, is, is glorious, um, even though you know he's well, he's he, he's a he's a dwarf with adenoidal tusks. Uh, is that, yeah, yes, that's correct. And um, has uh, an incredible vocabulary yeah. and, a, and a deadly sense of humor. And I, Clary, so for me, there are a lot of misfits in the book, and I use misfits in the best sense of the word. I love misfits. Um, but to kind of go back to your question, Doug, in terms of why a sissy, you know, he's the person who leaves, and that's the person I identify with. But I feel a, a, a great sympathy for people, or not even sympathy, but for people who stay, who don't feel that they can leave. And so the book is filled with a lot of people who simply don't have the wherewithal to change their circumstances. Um, and Clary is one of them. And I love Clary. He's, for me, in some ways, the hero of the book. He's my, one of my favorites. And when you read it, you'll, you'll know why. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, hey. Great. Um, I haven't read the book, so I'll be curious what we'll do, um, without giving any crucial plot points away, obviously. Uh, whether it's a sentence or a character arc or a well-placed word, what's something you're most proud of? So what comes in mind? With the book. With the book. He's <laughs> <laughs> not proud of it. <laughs> Anne says the last page, but I think that's just to get you to read the whole thing. And then we get to the last page to see what she was talking about. I think maybe, I think I maybe, I, I am proud of the last page because it took me so long to find that ending. And the ending came really the way that things often do when you're just sitting there at your desk and you're going crazy because you can't find what you need. And then we got up and took a walk. and. We walk a lot, we've been together 24 years, and so we started to do some math, as one does, when they're taking a walk. And we said, let's figure out how many miles we have walked together as a couple in 24 years. And so we did some you know, quick calculations, and we decided 10,000 miles was a, a modest estimate, but it was probably more than that. And so I won't say any more than that, but then I went home and that was the Solution to end it. Basically. I have one thing to say. Your phone will come in handy if you get steps on your phone. <laughs> 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 Thank you. That's Just to let you know. So, there we go. One more? Um, could, well, an observation and a question. The observation is the tiles on the floor look very similar. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, can you talk a little bit about the process of discovery, of figuring out that this was a novel as opposed to one of your wonderful short stories? How did you know? Was it the character or an event? Or? 
I don't think I ever thought it was going to be a short story. I think that years ago, when I first started thinking maybe I would write a novel someday, um, I was thinking, you know, okay, how about a Minnesota, Winesburg, Ohio? Because that seemed like a good idea. And so, because of how I grew up um, in a hardware store, I think of towns very much in terms of the businesses. And so I started writing sketches of the cafe, I started writing, you know, about the hardware store and all of these businesses, and then came in the people who work there and own them. And very early on, I realized that none of those people, they were all misanthropes. Um, and I like misanthropes, I'm a big fan of misanthropes, but that didn't seem quite like what I wanted. And then I discovered this whole errand. And as I said, it started this whole other concept, and then very quickly, I completely fell in love with Aaron, and I decided that I was just going to keep writing him, and it slowly, I had maybe, you know, I went through three or four computers. I'm sure I wrote well over a thousand pages. I started out on floppy disks. We used to keep them in a, in a vault at the bank, because we were always at the bank. You know, I don't know what we thought would happen to them, but we would, like every couple of months we'd say, we better bring the floppy disks to the bank. And so we would bring, that was all we had. I'm sure the bank thought that we were completely crazy. We'd go in there with our floppy disks to make our deposit. But I did not convert those floppy disks. Most of it never got actually put onto a in a form that I can use now. So there are, that, there are hundreds of pages that came to nothing. But when I sat down a couple of summers ago, basically, I pieced together this 500-page book that got cut down <laughs> to 350. Yeah. Perfectly. <laughs> all right, I think that'll do it then. All right, well, thank you. Lori, thank you. Thank you.